hard to see through here again. <laughs> There's still a few in the back, so I don't Okay. Know. Start signing in. Matt, are you good? Hi, guys. Welcome. Um, my name is Debbie. I'm with A&I. Um, this is the second retirement one we have this morning. It's on retirement strategies. Jim is the uh, presenter here. Um, he just became a member of the state uh, retirement team in July. In the past three years, Jim was a registered representative with Empowerment Retirement and was a contract employee with the Retirement Systems. So he's going to go over the presentation. If you guys have any questions at all, please let us know. Um, we are going to ask, though, you speak in this box because we're live streaming it. That way the people in the audience um, can hear it, okay? Thanks. Hi there, everybody. Thanks for being here. I think some of you are, were here in the first session, so you must be a glutton for punishment, although I love to hear my voice. Anyway, um, this is called the Retirement Strategy Seminar, and as much as I wish it was about fishing, it is not. Um, anyway, um, this, sem this seminar is uh, going to give you some, for those of you who are here at the first session, it's going to be somewhat redundant. There'll be some duplicate, uh, the same information given. However, I will cover some of the more pertinent things that those of you that are within, say, five to ten years of retiring will need to know. Uh, there, is a, there was a sign-up sheet in the back, and then you should all have these three handouts as well. If you were here for the first session, you don't need this glossy guy again. But if you weren't here for the first session, there's three different handouts. The glossy guy, then the guy that's sort of a purplish color, and then something called the investment options at a glance. So you want to have those three handouts. If you don't, you can go ahead and get up, and there, there are some in the back. You might want to have those. Anyway, this uh, seminar, as I said, is great for those of you who are getting close to retiring. Uh, I'll cover uh, different things to consider. I'll do a recap of the pension, Social Security, and deferred comp, and also talk about things you want to consider as you get closer to retiring. Hopefully the things you'll take away from this will be some goals, and that is thinking about when you want to retire. Have an idea. When is that final day? When do you plan to stop working? Because that really is going to determine a lot of the other uh, parts of how much should I be saving and how long do I have to save and so forth. So having an idea of when you plan to retire is really important, whether it's an age or a year, and also having an idea of what you plan to do when you retire are very important to be thinking about. I'll cover some of the other things, too, to consider is your retirement income sources, also what you should think about prior to retirement in terms of investments and then after retirement because sometimes our mentality and our risk behavior changes as we get older, and then also your different options with uh, the deferred comp plan in terms of taking distributions, when can you, and how does that work, and all the different methods at which you can withdraw funds from that plan. So when can you retire? Well, first of all, I think that slide should be more like, can I afford to retire? But when can you retire depends on the tier you are in. Uh, tier 1, if you were hired prior to uh, September 1st, 2012, you're in Tier 1. And Tier 1 in the pension states that uh, you're in Tier 1 and you can retire once you hit the age of 60. If you want to stop working or if you, you can stop working any time prior to that, you just can't apply for the pension benefit prior to age 60 without a reduction in that pension benefit. So Tier 1, it's age 60, or if you've met the rule of 85, Rule of 85 states that when your age plus years of service equal 85, then you could start applying for your benefit at that point. So an example might be if you're 55 with 30 years in the pension, 35, I mean 55 and 30 is 85. So that 55 year old could start drawing that pension benefit early. They wouldn't have to wait to get to age 60 if they chose not to. Now there's a tier two in the pension system. Tier two, slightly different rules. It's age 65. That's the earliest you can start drawing an unreduced pension benefit in that plan. Or, of course, you also still have the option of the rule of 85. The other thing is keep in mind both plans, whether you're in tier one or tier two, require a vesting period, and that's 48 months. You've got to be vested in the plan first to first qualify for the benefit. Then there's that minimum retirement age. I'm going to cover these different sources of income and how to consider them, uh, these sources of retirement income. I'll talk a little bit about Social Security, the pension, and then your personal investments and the things you need to do to manage those prior to retirement and after retirement. The first thing is talking about how much your, what kind of sources of income you'll have is thinking about how much you'll need for retirement and are you saving enough. And that's why for those of you that are here for the first session, you had this glossy handout. If you weren't here for the first session, you might want to grab this. 
because on the back side is the goal setting worksheet. It's two pages. That goal setting worksheet sort of helps you figure out a couple, answer a couple of questions. It'll answer, help you answer how much you'll have at retirement and also if you should be saving any more for retirement. Uh, briefly, some rules to keep in mind when you look at uh, that worksheet is how much money you are going to need in retirement. Generally, the experts today say you should try and replace 70 to 100% of your income when you retire if you want to maintain the same lifestyle you had prior to retirement. So you'll generally want to replace that, make that your goal. So step one, it says, how much do you currently earn? Step two or part two is saying, all right, what of this amount do you wish to replace? And I'm going to let you know, you'll need to think about replacing 70 to 100% of that income. If you are envisioning a very lavish retirement lifestyle, then you better be thinking more like replacing 100 or more percent at retirement. If on the other hand, you're gonna be staying put in Wyoming, maybe just do a little bit of traveling, you might be able to get by on replacing 60 to 70%. So that's why thinking about when you plan to retire and also what you plan to be doing have a lot to do with if you're going to have a successful retirement, if you're going to have enough to do the things you want to do. So that's this first step. Step two and three on this worksheet then help you through the worksheet. They give you some estimates on what you might anticipate receiving from Social Security and the pension. But I would encourage you to go to the pension site and the, and the Social Security site to get actual estimates instead of this. This isn't bad, but Social Security definitely for the Social Security estimate, I would go to your site, which is ssa.gov, and you'll see that, and I'll cover that, I think, in a couple of slides. Um, you'll, uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that, but I would encourage you to log into the Social Security site, get your own statement so you can see what the actual dollar amounts are. You can use this chart here for the pension information. Again, I'm going to encourage you to log into your pension account and get an actual estimate because that will show you how much each of the pension benefit amounts will be based on the data we have on you, and that'll give you a much better idea of what you're looking at in terms of dollar amounts. And then finally, the last couple of steps after you figured out how much you want to replace and how much you got coming in, if you have at least 10 years to go before you retire, the worksheet takes you through the steps of figuring out how much you need to be saving now based on various scenarios, based on various rates of return, how long you have to save, inflation rates. So it'll give you an idea of, okay, how much should I be saving? In terms of figuring out how much you're going to need when you retire, it's important that you remember that uh, when it comes to uh, income needs, you want to break it into the things that are essential and non-essential or the needs and the wants. Um, the things that are essential are the things you absolutely know you're going to have to pay when you retire. So when you think about retiring, you want to think about, okay, I want to replace so much of my re income, but well, what, am, what is it that I, why do I need to replace that amount? What is it that I am using that money to pay for? Well, you should think about putting a budget together when you're about three or so years out from retiring and break that budget into two categories when it comes to the, the essentials or the needs. And now you should break it into what will be essential, the absolute, th absolute things you have to pay for, and then the things that are discretionary, the things that you would like to be able to do. Now, this slide shows a partial list of both of those categories. We certainly could add a lot more to those essentials but you should really break it into those two categories so that you understand that there are things you know you're going to have to pay for. And the goal is that if you get all the essentials paid for, then you're going to be able to enjoy some of the things on the discretionary side of things. Now, what I'd like to toss out to you is that, are these essential or are these discretionary? So everyone's gonna have their own feeling on what for them might be essential discretionary. Um, I personally, this one I always chuckle over, I can't stand coffee, never have had it, but for some people this may be an essential, I suppose. But what I'm, the point of this slide is that you all have your own characteristics and things are important to you, and you need to make sure that you try to live within what your income will be and make sure you break it into those two basic parts, whether it's essential, discretionary, and also the fact of the matter is, is that something that was not an expense initially when you retire may become an expense. And I use the example of, let's say, you are doing all of your yard work and landscaping and snow removal when you first retire, but maybe 10 years later, you're not able to do all of that and you have to hire somebody. So now you went 
from something that was really not even an expense, maybe gasoline for the snowblower or the lawnmower, now you've got to pay somebody to do that. So your budget could clearly change in your retirement years, so you need to be aware of that, which means if an expense now comes into play later on down the road, that's something that's going to further erode that retirement income you've got coming in. So look at what you have for expenses, and if you're if you're like 10 years out, this 70 to 100% is a good factor, a good rule of thumb. But as you get within three or so years of retiring, we kind of recommend you might want to go through this list of coming up with your needs, bake it into essential and discretionary, and then practice living on what you anticipate your retirement income will be and see if you're able to pay for all those things on the essential list because it'd be better to kind of know before you retire if you're going to be able to make ends meet versus waiting to retire and find out you can't make ends meet. So maybe get an idea of what it's going to be like to live on that particular retirement income and are you going to be able to get by on what income you've got coming in based on the needs you have. And that's why it's good though still do that goal setting worksheet. Start seeing what it looks like in terms of dollar amount. Is it going to be doable? Compare this worksheet and then look at your essential expenses and is the income going to be sufficient to do what I want to do? So Social Security, I told you I'd talk about your sources of income, so here's the first one. And again, I told you, I encourage you to go ahead to the Social Security site, which is up here on the bottom at ssa.gov. It'd be very, I really encourage you to go into the site, create yourself, create your account so you can see what your Social Security statement looks like. But some of the rules you need to keep in mind are when can you start drawing your Social Security benefit and how much will that Social Security benefit provide? If our goal is to replace, let's say, 100% of our income, what I'm going to show you is as we go through this, how much Social Security and the pension will bring to the table. Social Security, here are the rules regarding it. At 62, that's the earliest any of us can draw Social Security benefit, but at 62, It'll replace, Social Security will replace about 25% of your salary, and that'll be a permanent reduction if you take it at that age as well. So that's kind of a whammy you need to consider is that if you take it early, it's not going to go up any higher. It's going to stay at that amount. Now, if you can wait to your full retirement age, which is your FRA, if you can wait to that point to start drawing that Social Security benefit, then Social Security will replace closer to 35 to maybe even 40% of your salary. Now, what is your FRA? It depends on the year you were born. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to rattle off the years, and then you can you might want to write down where you fall, what age, you're fall, what age you fall into. So here's how the categories go. If you were born between 43 and 54, that full retirement age is 66. If you're born in 55, your full retirement age for Social Security benefit is 66 in two months. And then it notches up by two-month increments through 1959. So an individual born in 59, their full retirement age would be 66 and 10 months. And then anybody born 1960 or later, their full retirement age is 67. So those are what's called the full retirement ages for Social Security. So if you can wait to start drawing the benefit at those ages, your Social Security benefit will replace closer to that 35 or 40 percent. Um, of your retirement income. So there's a couple of things to consider as to when you should take your benefit early or wait. And the experts say the, uh, the two questions to ask yourself are looking at your own family's longevity in terms of how long everyone's living and their health history, and then look at your own personal health history. If there's longevity in your family and you're in good health, then you will end up making more money out of Social Security if you can wait those few years and start drawing it at your re full retirement age. If, on the other hand, longevity and, and health is not so good in your family, then taking the benefit at 62, especially if you need the money, then taking it at 62 is the uh, other option for you. Now, there is going to be a break-even point that you will come across in Social Security in terms of deciding, should I take it early or wait those four or five years before drawing it? And for every one of you, it'll be a different uh, number of years and months. And I've had people tell me outrageous things. Sometimes they'll say, well, my break even is 20 or 30 years, and it's not that long at all. Then what I mean by break even is simply, if you take it at 62, you're going to get so much per month, but if you can wait that four or five years, you're going to get more. So maybe you're getting 1,000 a month at 62, but at 66 or 67, you're getting 1,500 a month. 
Well, if there's a break-even point where, assuming you live to the break-even point, regardless of each example, you will make more money by waiting to take it later because you will have accumulated more. For all of, it's, all of us in the room, it's going to be a different break-even point. And the only way for you to determine that is to look at your numbers on your uh, Social Security statement. It'll show you what your benefit will be at 62 and at your full retirement age. Um, I have seen it range anywhere from around nine years to 15 years for the break even. So what that means is if my full retirement age is 66 and my break even was 12 years, I need to make it to 78. And at that point, I will have now made more money. If you compare starting at 62 versus at 66 or 67, I've now made more money at that point. So in my case, my personal break even is only about 10 years. So if I make it to around 76 in two months, I will have made more money at that point than starting at 62. That's what I mean by that break even. So you might want to check and see what your numbers are um, to see if it's worth it because a lot of folks I think have been, are under the, uh, under the impression that they have to wait 20 or more years to break even. I've never seen it be that high. The highest I saw was actually somebody a few weeks ago and it was around 15 years and two months. And that sort of made sense because his income was a lot higher. He was a principal at a school. And I think the higher your income is, the less that Social Security actually replaces. Social Security is designed to replace those in a lower income bracket, replaces a greater percentage of income. So the more you earn, um, the less your Social Security benefit is. So it made sense in his case why his break even was a little higher in terms of 15 years. So. Social Security is one source of your retirement income. It's you know, there forever. As long as you live, you're going to get that amount. The decision is should you take it early or wait to your full retirement age, and only you can answer that. I'm now going to talk about the second part of your, uh, your retirement benefit being your pension. Let me stop for a second, though, to see if anybody has a question on anything talked about thus far. If you do, you have to talk into Debbie's uh, got a speaker box, I guess. No questions, anyone? Okay, so let me go on to the pension then and give you some of the explanation on your pension plan and how is that going to work with my Social Security. Well, the first thing is that your, social, your uh, pension benefit is based on these particular, these three parts that you see here uh, in terms of calculating your benefits. It's going to be your, your age, your years of service, and your highest average salary. Let me talk about your highest average salary real quick and then the age. A highest average salary is in tier one, we have the two tiers. And, and if you remember, I said tier one, if you were in the pension prior to September 1st, 2012, that's tier one. And under tier one, the, the earliest age at which you can draw a benefit is age 60. If you were in the pension plan uh, after September 1st, 2012, you're in tier two, and the earliest you can start drawing a pension benefit, an unreduced pension benefit is 65. Well, what your pension benefit in both of those plans is based on is something called your highest average salary. So for those of you in tier one, when you retire, we're gonna find your highest 36 consecutive months of salary while you're in the pension plan, and we'll divide that by three. Then that number will represent your highest average salary, and then that's what the pension replaces a portion of once you retire. The portion it replaces is based on your years of service. The more years you work, the greater the percentage that it replaces of your salary. So tier one, we use a 36 month history. Under tier two, we use a 60 month history. So upon retirement, we find your highest 60 consecutive months and divide that by five, and then that represents your highest average salary. So obviously, if you call right now and say, I wanna know exactly to the dime what my pension benefit will be, well, there's no way we know because we don't know, unless you're retiring today, we wouldn't know what your highest average salary will be. We have gotten calls from people who will will say, well, what might my pension benefit be in, 20, in 10 years? Well, we can give you an estimate, but that will be based on today's salary. There's no way to know what your highest average salary is going to be. We certainly don't know what you're paid. So how would we know what your salary will be when you eventually retire? So when you, when you get an estimate, keep in mind, it's based on your current salary. But when you retire, we will actually go back. When we get your pension app in hand, we'll go back and find that whatever your highest average salary was based on whether you have a 36-month history or a 60-month history. Um, based on which tier you are in. The other part is that I always like to throw out, throw out is I, meant, I mentioned that you have to be vested in the pension plan. Investing is 48 months, so you have to have 48 months first in the pension. Once you get to vesting, you qualify for the pension once you hit the retirement age for that particular plan. 
However, in tier two, what I always like to tell folks is if you happen to be in tier two, you have to be vested. You need 48 months to be vested, but we take a 60 month history. So if you were to quit after 48 months, after you're vested and move somewhere else and you're out of the plan, at 65, you're entitled to a benefit. Unfortunately, if we only have four years of salary history, because you're only in the plan four years, but we take a five-year salary history, we have to give you a zero for that fifth year. So it's going to lower the average of your highest average salary. So if you're in Tier 2 or you know anyone in Tier 2, encourage them to stay at least the five years. The other bullet point on this says age at retirement. Well, that's important because we look at your life expectancy. So if you're going to, you know, if you're really young when you retire, uh, your benefit, we have to, we're going to be paying you out over a longer number of years in addition to your beneficiary, your spouse, if you name a spouse as a beneficiary. So that's part of the formula as well. That looks at the ages of the players involved. Uh, so that's why I wanted to mention briefly the age does have some impact because we use actuary tables to try and estimate how long that person will be drawing benefits. So that goes into the calculation as well. But most of it is based on your years of salary and your age, or years of service, years of salary, years of service and your highest average salary. Now I'm going to tell you that on average we're finding that folks are putting in about 19 years in the pension. So 19 years, for those of you in Tier 1, would replace about 40.88% of your salary, whereas Tier 2 would replace 38%. And that's because the way the pension is calculated. But if you put in 19, 20 years, you're looking at replacing right around that 40 plus percent of your salary. So if you start combining that with your Social Security benefit, you can see how you start replacing that 70 to 100% of your income. Now we're going to bounce around. This is one of the things I dislike, but if you'll take out this handout, it's kind of a plum colored thing and it's printed on front and back. This is the, probably the most important part of the presentation because this covers the various pension benefit options. And if you're getting close to retiring, what's going to happen is you're going to have to fill out a pension application and you're going to have to pick one of these options. So what I'm going to do is go into a ridiculously long explanation of how they work, but that way you'll have a better feel for, hopefully you'll have a better feel for them when you are getting close to filling out the pension app. You'll have a better understanding of how they work. And a couple other things is that if you come over to the office, uh, you know, we're, we're on Yellowstone there, the, Century, um, uh, the CenturyLink building. Um, people often ask me during presentations, well, which do most retirees pick? Well, I'm going to preface by telling you, I'm, uh, first of all, I don't process anything at all. I have no idea. I don't do anything with pensions. I explain how it works, but I don't process a doggone thing. So I never see a pension application. Secondly, I sarcastically say when someone asks me, well, which, what do most people pick? Then, that, then I reply with, well, if I found out that the uh, average um, the, in, in, in Wyoming, the average Wyoming resident likes the flavor of chocolate, then that's your favorite flavor as well. Well, that's the same analogy I use with picking a pension app, uh, pension app or pension benefit. Those are up to you. That's why we offer so many because everybody's circumstance is different. So when I answer, if you ask me like, what, what do most people pick or what, how much I have, have withheld for taxes, we, don't, we can't help you with that. We don't do any tax preparing for you. We're not tax specialists. We just deal with the pension and the deferred comp. So if you start asking us, well, which one should I pick? And you know, how much will be withheld for taxes? You, know, it, you actually tell us what you want withheld for taxes when you fill out the pension app. So we can't tell you how much. We'll help you understand how it works, but we can't advise you on which one you should pick. So on to the options. A Couple of things to mention to you is that when you fill out the pension application, and you pick one of these options, once the state auditor's office punches the button to send you your first payment, your first retirement check, that's it. It's a done deal. You can't switch options. We can't change your benefit amount. We can't change your beneficiary. So if you are married and then you two get divorced after you retired and you remarry somebody else, we, are, we can't change and put a new beneficiary because remember, the options, the amount you get was based on three factors and one of them was age, well, once we have the two ages of the people involved, that's it. We can't, we, there's no substitutes like there is in sports, okay? It stays that we're going to use the same two per people when we calculate your benefit. So the moral of the story is if you're unhappy, get divorced before you retire, okay? Anyway, um, also this other little picture I'm going to draw for you is that every month you get paid, part of your pension benefit goes into your bucket, your pension balance. 
That's, you're required to put that amount in. The state is very generous in that they actually pay most of that eight and a quarter percent. So you're only paying a small portion of that out of your pocket, but the whole eight and a quarter that you're responsible for goes into your bucket. When you retire, we start paying you from that bucket. That's where your pension benefits come from first. That bucket only has about three to five years of pension benefits uh, in, total, in that bucket. So once you have retired and have exhausted your bucket, then we keep paying you, but we keep paying you from the reservoir that the employer had to be putting 8.37% of your salary into for everybody who's an employee under the pension system. So there's this big reservoir out there with this huge, unimaginable amount of money. That's what is going, that's what, how we're promising the benefits for decades for both you and your spouse, if you name your spouse as, one of the, as a beneficiary. But I want everyone to understand how it works. Your money comes from your bucket first, once your bucket's exhausted, if you're still alive or your spouse is still alive and drawing a benefit, we pay you from the reservoir. So that's what ensures you'll never run out of money. But your bucket of money is what we draw from first. And this will make sense as I explain these benefits too. So think about the bucket and the reservoir. So let me cover the pension ops, the uh, pension benefits. They're numbered one through five. All of them pay you, for you the retiree, a benefit for your entire lifetime. So you're gonna get whatever the amount is per month, forever, as long as you live. Now, what's the amount? Well, you can look that up by going, there's the website is on the bottom of this handout. That's the Wyoming Retirement homepage. That's a generic calculator under the pension plans tab. It says benefit calculator. And that's sort of a screenshot of what the calculator looks like. You can put the numbers in there and you'll get a set up. You'll, it'll give you uh, numbers associated with all these pension uh, options. Keep in mind, the, app, the calculator is only as accurate as the data you put into it. So it's only telling you based on what age you want to retire and what salary you put in. So it's a very general calculator. It's not specific to you. Whereas if you were to log into your pension account through that RAIN system, you can do an estimate on yourself. And that calculator is looking at you your individual information. So it's, it currently knows your highest average salary, so it's already taking that data. So you'll get a little more refined estimate if you were to log into your own pension account and go to the estimate tab and run an estimate. So you have two calculators. One's a little more generic. We'll get you close. That's on the Wyoming Retirement homepage. The second one is when you log into your account. That one's gonna be a little bit more accurate because it's got your current salary and it knows your hire date, so it's gonna calculate all your years and months and weeks of service and give you a little more, better, a better estimate. Anyway, step, uh, so all, the cal all of the options pay you a monthly amount for the rest of your life, and yes, they're all in gross amounts. We have no idea what your taxes are, so I have had that question come up. So whatever amount you see is, that's, that's gross amount. If you want taxes withheld, then you're not gonna get as much. And you tell us what you want withheld for taxes when you fill out your pension app. So option one pays just for you, the retiree. It pays for your lifetime and that's it. Once you pass away, payments cease. However, should you pass away when there is still some money remaining in your bucket that you didn't receive, and under option one, you get to at least name a contingent beneficiary who will get whatever is left over as a lump sum. They don't get payments, they just get what's left over. So remember, I keep saying there's only about three to five years of benefits in your bucket. Let's say you pass away after th four and a half years. There might be $516.25 left. I'm just throwing out numbers. That's all your beneficiary is going to get, the lump sum. So option one pays just for your lifetime and that's it. And it actually pays the second highest amount versus option five. I'll get to option five here momentarily. Option two is pays less, option two, three and four pay less than option one because under those options, we're gonna keep paying after you passed away. So under option two, there's a 2A and a 2P, or just a two and a 2P I should say. Under option two, we're gonna pay for your lifetime. When you pass away, we'll continue paying the same exact amount to your spouse or beneficiary, assuming, it's your, assuming your spouse is your beneficiary. Now you cannot name like a child under option two. You cannot name a trust or a will. The pension benefit is not designed to pay another entity for perpetuity. It's designed to pay for you, a retiree, and for one 
beneficiary. It's not designed to pay for you, then your wife, then your child, then your child's child, then your child's child, child. It doesn't work that way. Just you and your spouse. That's it. So option two pays you a lesser amount than one because after you pass away, we'll pay the same exact amount to your spouse for the rest of his or her lifetime or that beneficiary. And then when that person passes away, if there's still any money left in your bucket that the two of you did not receive, that would go as a lump sum, what's ever left would go as a lump sum to a contingent beneficiary. So we have the retiree, we have the retiree's beneficiary, and then we have the contingent beneficiary. So you, can, you could have up to three different players, but the contingent's only going to get the lump sum. They're not going to get payments. There's an option 2P, which works just like 2, except the difference is this, is that if you're worried, if you don't think your spouse will live as long as you, your beneficiary isn't going to live as long as you, you might still pick 2P because you want to provide them with a benefit. But if they predecease you and you've picked option 2P, once you let the Wyoming Retirement System know that the spouse has passed away, then your payment amount will pop up to option 1. Because now, because your spouse has passed away, we no longer have to pay anyone except you, the beneficiary, because you're, I mean, you, the retiree, because your beneficiary has passed away. There's no obligation for us to pay anyone other than you. So your payment amount will go up to what you would have gotten had you selected option one. But under option 2P, the difference between option 2 and 2P is this, is any money when you pass away, if there's still any money left in your bucket, you do not get to name a contingent beneficiary. Should there be any money remaining in your bucket after you've passed away, it gets poured into the reservoir. So you, under option 2P, you're still protecting your spouse because if you pass away, we'll still keep paying that amount to your spouse. But if your spouse predeceases you, then we no longer have to make payments to anybody but you, the retiree. So your payment amount increases to the amount you would have gotten in one, but you lose, you have no control over a contingent beneficiary. You do not get to name a contingent beneficiary under option 2P. Option three pays you a little more than two, but still less than one, because under option three, when you pass away, we'll continue paying 50% of the amount you were receiving to your spouse or beneficiary for the rest of his or her lifetime. And then when that person passes away, if there's still any money left in your bucket, it would go as a lump sum to a contingent beneficiary. 3P is just like 2P. Your spouse predeceases you, then your payment amount pops up to what you would have gotten in option one. But again, you don't get to name a contingent beneficiary. If there's any money left in your bucket, it gets poured into the reservoir after you've passed away. But remember, there's only about three to five years of benefits in your bucket anyway. So, you know, most people don't pass away and still have money left in their bucket. At that point, they're usually getting money from the reservoir or their pension benefits are coming from that reservoir I mentioned. Option 4A is called 10-year certain. 10-year certain works this way, is that we promise to pay a benefit for at least 10 years. And then what I mean by is that, let's say you've retired and you've picked option 4A, which is 10-year certain. You pass away in the seventh year, we'll continue paying for three more years. So we guarantee we'll pay for at least 10 years to a beneficiary. So you have up to 10 years to pass away. If you make it past 10 years, then we're not going to pay anybody. We'll keep paying you, but we're not going to pay for the beneficiary. So you get a benefit no matter how long you live, but the 10 year certain guarantee only goes to the, pri to the, uh, to the beneficiary. So again, you retire, you pass away, say in the seventh year, well, we'll pay for three more years to your beneficiary. You pass away though after 10 years and one day, no payments to the beneficiary because you made it for at least the 10 year certain period. But if you're still alive 11 years, 12 years, 20 years later, you're still getting a benefit. It's just the 10 year certain applies to the beneficiary. 4B is called 10 year certain, exact same example I just gave except it covers 20 years. And somebody might be thinking, why do you offer all these different options? Well, like the 4A and the 4B, I don't know. Maybe you have a special needs child at home. Maybe you're, maybe under 4A, you're, uh, you're getting ready to retire at 60 and you have a 16-year-old you're caring for. And you want to make sure that the 16-year-old still has some benefit should you pass away. So if you took the 4A as an example, the 10 you're certain, you retired at 60 and you pass away at 65, well, that 
16 year old would still get benefits for five more years. While they were in your household and you were getting a benefit, obviously you were caring for them. Now that you're gone, maybe they're on their own. Well, this ensures they're gonna get a benefit for five more years. So that would take them to age 26. And hopefully by the time they're 26, they're on their own. Chuckle, ha ha ha, right? Anyway, um, so that's um, you know, an example of where you might use the, the 20 year certain or the 10 year certain. Uh, the the, the uh, three, uh, option three and three P, well, maybe your spouse has plenty of retirement benefits, but needs a little bit of income if you're not around. That's why we offer different scenarios because everybody's situation is different. Finally, option five is the at last option and it actually pays slightly more than option one and really only wear for maybe three to $15, maybe $20 a month more. And the difference is this, though, under option five, you don't get to give any of the money if you pass away and there's still some money remaining in your bucket. When you pass away, if there's any money left, you don't get to give it to a contingent beneficiary. Any money left in your bucket gets poured into the reservoir. And literally, option five only pays three to maybe $20 a month more than option one. 20 is the most I've ever seen, actually, the difference between option one and option five. I have actually, most of the time, I've only seen it be about five or six dollars a month difference between option one and the option five amount. And we actually did have someone, I passed away a few months ago, who still had picked option five, and her bucket still had like 30 or 40,000 in it. So that money, she didn't get to name anybody, it got poured into the pension reservoir. I always say, you know what, if you need five or six dollars a month more, maybe you shouldn't be retiring because that's about the difference from option one to option five. Anyway, those are the options. Um, probably the most important decision you'll make when you fill out the pension app is which one of these to take. Again, don't ask us to tell you which one you should take or which one do most people take. I always tell folks to ask themselves two questions, which I learned from George, and he said, tell, uh, ask yourself question one is, what's the minimum amount that you need to get per month? So you can, as I told you, you can go to calculator and get a dollar amount for all of these. And then the second question is, is anyone relying on me, relying on this money, if I'm not around, would they still need to continue to get this benefit? So if the second part of that question is yes, the second, if the second question is yes, then you're gonna limit your choices to two, two P, three, and three P, because those are the only ones that continue paying after you've passed away, because you can give that to a spouse or even in option three's case, it could, be a, uh, it could be a child if you wanted to. That would be kind of crazy in my opinion, but you can do that if you want. So those two, option two, two P, three, and three P keep paying after you pass away. If your spouse doesn't need any financial aid, because they've got plenty of money from their own pension or they're in the state pension, then you can pick option one because it pays the most and it'll just pay for your lifetime. So that's the options. Any questions on those before I move back to the calculating the pension benefit? Okay, so now we're back to the pension again, how it's calculated. I dislike the way this jumps around, but I'm stuck to the script. So anyway, option, uh, tier one, this is a slide that you would have seen if you were here in the first presentation. This is just explaining how is your pension benefit calculated. Well, guess what? I told you you can go to the calculator, which is on the Wyoming Retirement homepage, or is in this black box here is the site address. The calculator does all this for you. You don't need to know that uh, the, the ratios jump, but if you're in tier one, the nice part is that during the first 15 years, the pension benefit replaces two and an eighth percent of your salary or replaces two, two and an eighth percent of your, what will be your highest average salary. And then on the 16th year, it jumps to two and a quarter percent. Well, that's what this chart is showing is that during the first 15 years, we calculate what your, uh, get, look at your highest average salary. We calculate, uh, we take 15 times two and an eighth percent, which I think is 31.88 percent. That's multiplied times your highest average salary. That gets the first sum. And then on the 16th year, the pension replacement factor jumps to two and a quarter percent. So we're gonna, replace, we're gonna multiply two and a quarter times, in this case, seven years. That times, then that total times uh, that person's highest average salary, you get the second sum, and that shows what your annual pension benefit will be. Tier two, the math is really simple because the replacement factor is a straight 2% a year. So if you work in the pension 26 years, 
the pension will replace 52% of your salary, because 26 times 2 should be 52. Whereas I couldn't do that for you in tier 1 because it jumps, so I'm not sure what the ratio is at 26 years, but I have a chart that shows me exactly what the percent is based on how many years you've put in. So keep in mind that in your retirement years, you're going to be living on a fixed income, and the problem is, is that our expenses don't stay fixed. We have to deal with inflation. And what this chart shows is that if you felt you could get by on about 36,000 a year, and if you happen, if inflation's around two and a half, three percent a year, and if you happen to screw up and live 20 years in retirement, look how much you'll need to buy the same goods and services 20 years later. So you need to be prepared for the fact that even though you're living, that you're retired, your expenses, unfortunately, are not retired. They keep going up, and I'm sure that is no shock to anyone. You have to pay taxes on your, your retirement income. You still got to pay property taxes. You still have to pay homeowner's insurance. You're going to have to pay for auto insurance, registering your vehicle, health insurance. So you got to budget for those things. And that's why we talk about what are your essential expenses, what are your discretionary, and make sure you think about the what ifs. What if I've paid for all my bills this month and now the hot water heater went out on the house or, or I need a car repair? Those are the what ifs, and that's why you need to be saving for retirement, you know, in another, another vehicle. Be saving at least somehow, some way. So are you going to find yourself with a gap? Is it possible you might not have enough to retire on? Let's say you did the goal setting worksheet and you were trying to get by in about 36,000 a year like this slide is showing. And between Social Security and the pension, you're only going to be able to replace about 29,000. So where's, the, where's that 7,000 going to come from? Well, the goal setting worksheet does help you figure that out in the last two steps. And in this case, we did calculate that this person, using the example of the person who had 22 years in the pension who was retiring at 62, he would need to have saved up $137,000 in an outside account that he could then draw on about $7,000 a year, assuming he got a 6% rate of return. He'd have enough money in there to draw that, that $7,000 a year for 25 years. So he's 62. We're going to have him draw money till he's, what, 87. He's got enough in there till 87, which is about the average. That's actually three more years than the three or four more years in Social Security says the average male will live anyway. Is, is, uh, I think they say 83 is the average life expectancy on Social Security tables. So that's covering you for a, a rather long time. And that's what the worksheet helps you figure out at the last two steps. So what if you've got at least 10 years to go? And that's, that's one of the limitations on the worksheet is we're assuming you've got 10 years to go. If you do have 10 years to go, well, how much do you need to save if you could earn 6% a year and you had started with nothing? Well, you need to be putting away 818 a month. If you had a little more saved up, then you could get by on 551. If you had even more saved up, 50,000, then $284 a month. And finally, if you had a $75,000 nest egg, $20 over the next uh, $20 a month over the next 20, 10 years or 120 months would get you to your 137,000. That would help. That you, you could draw that 7,000 a year then to help fill that gap. So, what is it? What are some other things you need to consider? Timing of your Social Security benefit with your pension benefit is a big one. Here's an example of an educator. I believe this was an actual educator. She met, met, the, met the rule of 85. She was 55, had 30 years in the pension, so she decided to retire at age 55. And these are some actual numbers. That was her highest average salary. And you can see her benefit's going to be 24000 And she chose that option, too. So we'll continue paying a benefit to her spouse after she passes away. So the big thing is that, whoops, what is it that she's not going to, she's going to have to wait for for seven years? And that's what this shows us. What does she not have coming in for a while? Social Security. So that's why knowing how the rules work between the Social Security and the pension are very important. If you're going to retire early, congratulations. If you're meeting the Rule of 85, that's fantastic. But what is it you're going to do in the meantime before that Social Security benefit kicks in? What's going to help you fulfill, what's going to help you meet that income gap? because you may be living on that 24,000 uh, annual salary or maybe even 36,000. Is that going to be enough to pay all those essential expenses? What happens if you have a what if occur? And of course, there's insurance you're going to have to pay until you're 65, unless you're on the state plan. And even if you're on the state plan, you got to pay for that. So there's some things to consider as you get close to retiring. And whether you want to retire early, can you afford it? That's why that first slide I jokingly said, it's more like, can you afford to retire? 
So what if you find yourself with a little bit of um, a gap? What are your options? Well, obviously, I think the first bullet point is everyone's first choice. Gosh, yeah, I'm thrilled. I want to work longer. Well, no, that may not be your first choice. Maybe you'd like to do something else. Well, you could cut back on hours. Maybe you could just be, go to part-time uh, work afterward, maybe just to pay for the insurance or something like that. Um, you can, as you know, uh, you can go back to work in the pension um, after you've retired, but and you can actually draw a pension and draw a salary, but that is not like a special benefit that's designed for employees. That's called the retire, retire, Rehired Retiree Policy, and that's actually for the employer that cannot successfully fill your position. If they, some, uh, some school districts do this quite a bit where they can't fill a position in a small community, they might offer that position back to that retiring educator. So the educator can say, yep, I'd like to keep drawing my pension and also drawing, uh, getting a salary. So it's not like a special plan to help you earn more. It is just an option for an employer. If they decide they can't fill your position, they might offer you on a one-year contract, please come back to work. Well, you could continue drawing your pension and get the salary, or you could say, you know what, that salary is so good, I, won't, I don't need my pension, I'll postpone my pension for another year and keep drawing that salary. And that's called the Rehired Retiree Policy. Uh, there's more to it. I just want you to know that, yeah, that is an option. I just like to make sure folks understand it's not like some special plan that allows you to be retired and going back to work. It's really an option for an employer who may have difficulty finding a, a replacement for what you did, and they may offer you a position back. Well, it's a possibility you could do something like that. But we make you sit out at least 30 days. You have to be officially retired. We have to have your pension app in hand. You have to be officially retired by your employer. Um, they, that means your final pension contribution has been received by the Wyoming Retirement System. And I'm going to tell you that all those things take more than 30 days. So you will be out of work for more than 30, closer to 60 or 90. But it is possible you might be able, if an employer cannot fill a position, then you could apply for it again. Um, the big thing is there can't be any written, verbal, or under, any understanding between you and that employer that they were going to hire you back. If we find out that occurred, then, uh, and you're getting your pension benefit and a paycheck, your pension benefit will stop until you re actually retire officially. Anyway, so you can work, but let's say you work part-time in another job. That's not a problem. Your pension benefit will not be penalized whatsoever by you working in a part-time job. It's the only issue you have is if you go back to work for any agency in the pension system, you got to sit out that 30 days. Even if it's part-time, you got to sit out at least a minimum of 30 days. You have to be officially retired. But if you go back to work after, the, after you sat out, you've been officially retired, meaning your pension app is in, we've gotten your final pension contribution, then you can work part-time and get your pension check and get your paycheck. Um, how about what do you plan to do in retirement? Where do you plan to live? What do you plan to do? If your plans include traveling to Europe every year, maybe you're going to have to cut back and go every one, once every five years in order to make ends meet. So there's things you might want to think about in terms of your retirement lifestyle. Uh, reduce your current expenses before retiring. I always tell folks if they can, try to make sure you retire. Um, pay off your mortgage before you retire because that's still one of the biggest expenses retirees report. Uh, watch what you do pay for, like education, like for a grandchild or something like that. I think it's really honorable when people want to help out a child because they don't want to see that child with a college debt. But on the other hand, if you dip into your own retirement savings to pay for that expense, is that child going to help reimburse? Are they going to pay for your retirement, essentially? You know, it's a lot easier to get a loan for an education than it is to go out and get a retirement loan. They don't really have loans at the bank for retirement. They just have car loans and home loans or or college loans. And of course, save as much as you can while you're working. Because I tell folks, you know, there's nothing wrong. The more you save in retirement is going to give you more options when you do retire, especially for those of you hitting the rule of 85. If you've got more saved up, it's going to give you more flexibility to be able to meet those challenges in terms of that gap waiting until Social Security comes in. It's going to just give you more flexibility. So saving as much as you can during your working years is, is two things. One, you're going to accumulate wealth. And secondly, it'll allow you to, to be able to, to uh, have more choices if something happens where, could I retire early? If you've saved up a lot, 
then you might be able to. But if you've not been saving, then you, maybe you won't be able to retire early. So saving is, is going to help you uh, with some of your getting some of the answers to some questions that occur as you get closer to retiring. In the, one of the ways you can save, of course, is for the deferred comp. And the deferred comp, uh, you can put up to $20. The minimum is $20. And if you're in the plan, you know the state's giving you a $20 match. Sadly, they don't match any more than that, but that's how it goes. So you get a $20 match. If you're not in the plan, you probably should think about getting into it because you're leaving $20 on the table. Now, the IRS says if you're at least, if you're under the age of 50, they'll let you contribute up to $18,000 a year in the deferred comp. So that would allow you to save a lot more for retirement. And upon reaching age 50, you can save an additional $6,000 on top of that, which would be $24,000 a year. You can also do two other things. One's called the special catch-up. A special catch-up means once you're within four, uh, three years of retiring from the pension, so you're within three years of your normal retirement in the Tier 1 or Tier 2, if you've not been saving a whole lot, the IRS will let you actually go above that 24000 amount up to possibly 36000 So it's a way for an individual who's maybe not been very good at saving while they were young to go ahead and kind of sprint to the finish. And lastly is, for those of you that have accumulated a lot of unused sick and vacation time, if you don't need that paid out to you, because if, they, if uh, the state pays it out to you, you of course you're going to get taxed on it. And a lot of you do have a lot of unused sick time you're going to get a big paycheck for on your last day. If you don't need all of it, if you want to, you can slap some of it into your deferred comp account, and that way it won't be taxed to you until you actually start to withdraw the funds. So you, you might still need some of it to maybe pay for insurance or whatever until your Social Security kicks in or even until your pension kicks in. But if you don't need any of it or part of it, you could put some of it, again, as long as you stay within the limits. You can't exceed the IRS limits of the 18000 the 24000 or the special catch-up limit. But if it's, if it's money that you maybe don't need, don't want to get taxed on right away, you could throw it into the deferred comp. So there are some things you need to consider um, with your sources of income. I've already talked about the pension, the Social Security, and those you don't have a lot of control over. Um, the pension you do because it's based on your years of service. So the longer you work, the greater your benefit will be. Social Security, not a whole lot you have any control on that. Social Security looks at your 35 years of salary when they calculate your benefit. So um, the, the longer you're working in that case, I guess, and if you can get into a higher paying job, at, time, at, po at some point your Social Security benefit continues to go up. Now if you earn too much, when I say too much, if you start earning like in the 75, 80 plus thousand, your Social Security benefit isn't going to be so great because remember Social Security is to help those that lower income. So the more you earn, the less it actually replaces. So if you start earning, you know, 100 plus thousand, your Social Security benefit is actually going to start to taper off a little bit. But if you earn an average income throughout your work history of around 30, 40, 50, 60,000, then I was quoting you that Social Security would replace anywhere from 25 to maybe 40 percent. That's pretty accurate for most of you. So Social Security, again, you don't have a lot of control over, you know, you, depending on your income, it's really, you know, if you can earn more, you might end up getting more in Social Security, but it, it looks at your 35 years history. So what do you have control over? Well, that's going to be what you've been saving, the money you've been putting aside on your own, because you have to think about how long you need that money to last, and then um, what are your options with taking money out of that plan? And I'm going to be talking specifically about the deferred comp and the ways you can manage it. The first thing when it comes to any investments is understanding how is that money mixed amongst the different investment choices. Is it the best mix for me? We call that asset allocation, and it basically is just how you divide your investment dollars between the investment options you have. Because different investments perform differently under the same market conditions. Some can have more potential return, but have more volatility associated with them. So you want to make sure you have the best blend of investments for where you are in your life in terms of how long you have before you need to take that money out, and is it the appropriate amount of risk for you as well. So having a good asset allocation is going to help you do a couple of things. One is it's not going to eliminate all negative returns. You still can have a, re a negative return, but it may minimize when the market has a bad day. It may not be as drastic. Also, 
it's very unique to you. Everybody has their own style. Even a husband and wife are going to have their different levels of risk and return and expectations. So just because I may be more aggressive, maybe my wife is more conservative, that's fine. That's what's best for her. She likes strawberry, I like chocolate. Same sort of concept. We all have our different preferences. And the other part is that it's going to help you get it's going to hopefully get you the best return. Doesn't mean you're always going to have a positive return, but at least you're getting that balance between the amount of risk you're willing to take on and the amount of return you're, or the, I should say it the other way, the amount of return you want with the amount of risk you're comfortable with taking on with that expected return. So asset allocation is blending of these, these four different asset classes. And each of these asset classes has a different rate of potential return. And return simply means it's not interest rate. Return means I paid for it at this amount and when I sell it I hope it's at this amount. I hope to have a gain in that, uh, that value of that account. So investments don't pay interest. You look at their return. I hopefully bought them at one dollar and I sell it at ten dollars. That's my return. Well cash alternatives are the things that have the least amount of risk associated with them. They're things that you might think of that are with, they're like cash types of accounts. It could be a bank account. We have something called the uh, stable value fund. That's one of our cash alternatives. It, the good news with the stable value fund is that it never goes down when the market goes down. The bad news is it doesn't go up either. It barely makes one and a quarter percent right now, which is great compared to the bank, but that sucks compared to the market and it sucks compared to inflation. But if you want a safe place to park your money, that's a great place. Unfortunately, over time, you might lose money in that account because it's not even growing at the pace of inflation. A second category are bond funds. They're like, they pay a rate of return in terms of dividends. They are like giving a loan to a company and in return the company is gonna pay you a dividend back. So because there's risk associated with those companies or even those government agencies paying, usually there's not as much risk with a government agency, uh, but there's some risk, more risk associated with the bond, so they have a little more potential return than cash alternatives. Real assets are investments that combine multiple types of classes like cash and bonds and also stocks, and their main goal is to just give you a hedge or equal uh, rate of return with inflation. So they're trying to make sure at least your money is growing at that rate, which is a safe rate. You want to make sure at least your investments are going at that rate. Finally, stock funds, which have the most potential return, but clearly have the most volatility. There's no doubt over the short term, they can be really up and down. But over the long haul, you're going to make more money in those investments than you will the other three. It's just a matter of are you comfortable having all stocks or not, or having a little bit of everything. This slide shows you a comparison of those four different categories and how they react in the same market conditions. The red line is stocks, the dark blue line is going to be bonds, and then there's sort of a turquoise line color which is going to be real assets. Doesn't have the same length of history as the other two. And then finally we have cash which is this green line. And yes, I know there were days back in the 80s when you could get a CD for 13%. But then again, mortgage rates were 18. So, you know, I've had people say, oh, I remember when I got that 10, 12% CD. Yeah, that was a great time back in the 80s. I remember locking somebody in in a mortgage, I think, 18%. Can you imagine paying 18% on a 30 year mortgage? Yeah, isn't that absurd? But you could have gotten a CD for 12%. So that's the thing is that we can't have both high CDs and low interest rates. It just doesn't work that way. But what we're showing you is that here's all those four different investment classes and how they've reacted during the same market conditions. And what's imperative from this is that they don't always follow and go to the same peak or valley. They may move in the same direction in some instances, like, well, right here, um, every, we had some stuff moving up. Bonds and stocks were going up, but stocks continued upward while bonds tapered off. And then there's times when stocks are the dogs and everything else is doing well, and then there are times when stocks are outperforming. The good news is that stocks, when we look at their history, they have more, they're all, they have more times they're above the zero line than they are below. That's the nice part. So this is really showing you, though, that those four classes, having all of your money in one is not necessarily the wisest thing. If that's what you want to do, that's fine, then do that. If that's what helps you sleep at night but you're going to be risking, you're going to be exposing yourself to different types of risk 
if you just keep it in one particular investment. So the idea is asset allocation, trying to do a blend of all of these, but blending them so that it's the most comfortable mix for you based on your time horizon, how long you have before you know how to start withdrawing those funds. And some of the risks that I was hinting to, two of them are listed here. Inflation risk is simply, if you're just being a little bit too conservative, you may end up not making as much money over time. You're like that stable value fund I mentioned, a fantastic fund, it pays one and a quarter percent, which is great if you compare it to a bank rate. But if you compare it to inflation, it's not very good because inflation's around two and a half percent or so around here. So my money is, I'm, able, I'm not able to purchase as much with that money every year because the cost of goods are exceeding what my money's earning. So inflation risk would be being too conservative and not having enough growth in your investments. On the other hand, market risk would be the individual who says, wow, I started in the game really late, so I'm gonna plow everything into stocks. Problem with that is you might get a good return this year, but what if you're gonna retire next year and the market tanks, your account value might decrease immensely, and now you, you can't withdraw those funds until the market value improves where you're able to start withdrawing some funds. So that might delay your retirement, or you might have to use some other source of income until the market improves and that account gets better. So you don't wanna be so conservative, and the other end, you wanna be at so con aggressive as well because you can put yourself at risk. Um, we explain the two investments, this third handout, is the investment options at a glance, the guy that's stapled together. You get this every quarter when you're in the deferred comp, and it shows you the latest returns. So we actually help you with your asset allocation by allowing you to either choose your own path, the mix your own, and the mix your own start on this first page where it says mix your own. There's 10 different, there's 15 different mutual funds to choose from, and you can pick, mix and match how you want. Now, on a sidebar, those of you that got your June statements also got a letter showing, telling you that there's going to be a change in these funds. We're actually going to be going to a category system. So instead of individual funds, we're just going to have a large cap category, a capital preservation, a small and mid cap, an income category, an international category, and then a real assets, I believe. I, I hope I got the six categories right. Anyway, um, now instead of you trying to figure out which individual funds, you just will pick a strategy and we already have put funds into that category for you. So most, some of these funds will not be offered anymore. If you're in the mix you're on, what's going to happen is you're automatically going to be mapped or moved over into the new category. So if you have a large cap fund, you'll be into that fund, whatever category. We have a large cap category, that's what you'll be moved into. If you have a large cap and a small cap fund, then you'll have some of the large cap category fund and then some of the small cap. And that's what that letter was showing you. The funds that are inside of each category have already been mixed by uh, our investment team, and, but they hired a third party that does this sort of analysis in terms of investments. So they picked some incredibly uh, good performing funds and low expenses, which are all good things. Um, they've got some funds that you would not normally be, uh, will be available to you that are now gonna be part of the new categories. And if you wanna see the new, what funds are in the new category, you have to go to the Wyoming Retirement homepage. On the, on the very first page, if you scroll down to the bottom, it'll show the six categories and you click on them, it'll then show the name of the funds that are in those categories. And they actually, the great news is that I think all but one fund, the uh, expense ratio decreased and you're actually gonna get more funds now instead of you know the old way where you had, if you picked, we only had one bond fund to choose from. Well now if you pick the income category, you're gonna have I think three funds or five funds in that category. So you're gonna have massive diversification. Again, asset allocation and diversification. You're getting both of those and those are good things. So for those of you in the mix your own, you're gonna see a change in your account come September 30th. If you're doing the pre-mix funds, and those are the, right here on the first page, those are the life path funds, no change to those whatsoever. Those funds already are blended for you and automatically change from stocks to more conservative investments as one gets closer to retirement. Whereas if you do the mix your own, you, kind of, you have to do that yourself. No one's going to rearrange it and switch it for you as you get older. There's gonna be one other option, one other change. If you're really a savvy investor and wanna do your own thing, we're gonna have a, a, a self-directed brokerage account. You go through your deferred comp account and you can sign up to do your own investing through TD Ameritrade. And I believe there's like 1,500 different mutual funds you can choose from. So if you don't like 
what is offered in the deferred comp. Unfortunately, it will cost an extra $50 a year, but you will be able to go into TD Ameritrade. You'll still have a 457 plan. You'll just have this account out here, and you can choose whatever's in there. That's your thing, though. We don't give any guidance or ex we don't know what's in there. That's yours to choose. So, that's, so if you do that, that's definitely for the more educated uh, investor who understands the different categories and strategies. So that's the change that's coming. The premix funds, to get back to them, here's how they look in terms of risk and return. They all have the same investments in them. So there's the retirement fund and then the 2060 fund and everything in between. Well, the 2060 fund has the same investments that the retirement fund has. It's just that the 2060 fund, which implies that's the year you'll turn 65, is in the year 2060. That fund will have a lot more stocks in it and very little bonds and cash. But as the year 2060 approaches, the stocks categories will be slowly reduced and the cash and bonds category will be slightly increased. And how it, how it will change is right here on this slide. This is an illustration of the 2040 uh, Life Path Fund. Today, you would have almost 75% in stocks, which is represented in the red. And then as the next 40 years ensue, or in this case, the next 25 years ensue, the fund will gradually be readjusted so that when, the, when it hits its target date in the year 2040, it will have mostly cash and bonds in it, which is the green and blue, and you'll see the stocks have been reduced drastically. So that's what all of those target date funds do. They will look like this upon their target date. So you get that automatic management for you. The mix your own, you have to be a little more knowledgeable of what you're doing and understand the risk and return. And again, risk is, well, how much, how, what return do I need to have? Am I willing to take on more risk? Well, we have really conservative investments. We've got that stable value, which we're keeping it. It's going to be called the WRS Capital Preservation Fund. So it's staying the same. So if you own shares in it, you'll still have that. We have, we'll have an income fund, which is that bond fund. We're getting rid of the money market fund, by the way, which is horrible. It barely made a tenth of a percent. So that, that's a that's wasting your money, putting money in that thing. And then we'll have a real asset category, and then we'll have some multiple stock funds to choose from. And again, there'll be different levels of return and risk associated with them. International global funds, small cap funds, tend to have more risk associated with them than US large cap. So again, you can take on as much risk as you want, but, but if you take on more risk, hopefully you're gonna get more return, but that's not a guarantee you're gonna have those ups and downs. You're gonna have a lot more drastic volatility when you're all in stock. So be careful. It's good to have a little bit of stock in your investments, but you need to be comfortable with your time horizon, understanding how much time you have before you retire, and we will not need to start withdrawing those funds. If you're gonna, going to do the mix your own, it's good to take that risk tolerance quiz. It's on the website, it's on, the defer, it's on our homepage, and it's under, uh, I think, tools on the deferred comp tab. And it's a very simple quiz. It'll give you an idea of two things. It'll tell you what type of risk taker you are, and then also it'll help you evaluate your time horizon, how long you have until you think you want to withdraw the funds. And all those things will help you determine what type, how to mix, what investments are appropriate for you at this point in time. Now, let's say you've retired though. What are your options with a deferred comp? When can I take the money out? And how can I take the money out? And how long will it take to get the money out? Well, the, I'll answer that first question, last question first. How long will it take? This comes up a lot. Folks will come in and they've retired that day and they think that, that we give them a check that day. Well, we can't. We have to, by law, we have to wait until your employer has terminated you in the pension system and we also especially if you want to take a full distribution of your deferred comp, we have to wait until the state auditor has made a final contribution because if, as an example, let's say you're quitting today. Well, you're getting paid for August or September. You're going to get a paycheck in September. There's most likely going to be a September contribution to the deferred comp unless you've stopped it. So if you haven't stopped it, the state's going to put another 20 or whatever dollars you've been putting in. You're going to get that match. Well, if you want us to give you the whole balance, we don't know what the balance is until the final amount's been put in. So we can't give you that money right away. So there's going to be a, a lag time, and that's because we have to, by law, we're required to wait until... You're, you're terminated in the pension system 
and until we know what your balance is. Now, if you're just taking a partial withdrawal, then we don't need to wait for that final contribution. It's only if you're going to try to take a full distribution. So I just want you to realize that it's going to take a good 30 days from after your last day and maybe longer if we have to wait for the state auditor to put it, money into the plan because we don't know what your balance is. Yes, we send you a statement, but if there's money going in, we have, you know, there's no reason to send you what's in there today if another $20 is going to be thrown in there two weeks from now. That's kind of crazy. So um, anyway, you can take your money out as soon as you quit or retire. It's just you may get it. And if you already re have been retired for a couple of months, then we don't have to wait for all that rigmarole. You're going to be able to get paid probably fairly quickly, a couple of weeks. Um, so what are the other options? You can leave the money in the plan. You can take it all out, you can take it out as you need it, or if you're going to work someplace else, you can roll it over into their plan. The only thing you're required to do, though, is unfortunately at 70 and a half, you do, if you leave the, plan in the, if you leave the money in the plan at 70 and a half, you do have to start taking some of it out, and that's an IRS requirement, and that's called a required minimum distribution. And we actually send you letters on your 70th birthday, around when you turn 70, you'll, right after you turn 70, you actually get reminders from us just saying, you know, just to let you know you got to do this. We don't want you to get in trouble, but here's the amount you got to take out this year. So we try to make sure you get what you have to take out each year, starting at 70 and a half. There is no penalties for withdrawing your money once you quit or retire. It's just taxes. So if you quit before 59 and a half, a lot of people think I have to be a certain age before I can take the money out. No. The IRS rules are as soon as you quit, retire, or change employers, you can withdraw the money. There's no minimum age. You just have to quit or retire. What will you owe? Just taxes. If you were making pre-tax contributions, you'll just have to pay taxes on the amount you withdraw. If you were doing an after-tax contribution, then you won't have to pay any tax on any money you roll out, pull out as long as you're at least 59 and a half. Again, IRS rules. If you're 59 and a half and you've had an after-tax 457 plan for at least five calendar years, you won't owe any tax when you pull that money out. But again, there's never a penalty on the deferred comp and no minimum age, but you do have to have quit, retired, or changed employers. That's the main thing. What are the, your options with withdrawing the money? You can take it all out, you can take it out as you need it, or you can set up so you just get a, a certain amount every month or every year until the piggy bank's empty. Remember, it is a piggy bank, so it only lasts as long as there's money in the account. So we do have some folks who will set up their budget where they'll have their pension and their Social Security pay those essential bills. And if that's not enough, if those two things, the pension and Social Security aren't enough to cover the essentials, then they'll set up a payment system out of their deferred comp to make up the difference. And then on top of that, you can still take discretionary or extra uh, distributions from your 457 plan. So you're not locked into anything. You could set up um, like $100 a month, and you can do that for three years and then stop if you want. Or you can increase the amount, or you can decrease the amount. It's not like when you start a payment plan, you have to stick with it. You can do anything you want on that deferred comp. The only thing you have to deal with is the budgeting part. How long do you want that money to last? And remember, once the money's gone, that's it. It's, that's it. So you have all kinds of options with it. Where does the money come from on your deferred comp? Well, it comes from the shares that you have. If you're, in the, if you're doing the mix your own stuff, you can either specify what, a, what investment you want liquidated, or if you don't, they will just take a, a proportion out of each so you keep the same ratio uh, from, uh, you'll have the same ratio or percentage of investment prior to the trade. So if you had three investments, and they, uh, one of them represented 25% and the other two represent the other 75%, after you liquidate shares, you'll still have that same ratio, that same amount. Or you can specify, nope, I want you to liquidate just that investment. So you have that flexibility. Now that's for those of you that mix your own. If you're doing the premix funds, well, there's nothing for you to decide. You're in just that one fund and we're just gonna liquidate enough shares in that account to pay you what you need. What you should remember about asset allocation, though, especially for those of you doing your mixing your own, is that over time, one of your investments might start to produce more, do better than the others, and now you might be exposing your entire portfolio to more risk because of that investment has grown. Maybe it's the stock portfolio, which has more volatility. So be aware of how your investments 
uh, in terms of their weighted average with what your entire balance is. If you have one growing better, which this slide shows, like stocks have gone from being 25% to 45%, you might say, hey, fantastic, my stocks have really done well. The problem now, though, is that we go back to that graph that showed the sharp up and down. Now you're exposing yourself to the volatility of the stock. So you might want to just see if you're balanced appropriately, and if you're not, you can, uh, you can go onto your account and actually have, uh, have it set up so Empower will rebalance. And you specify what you want, how you want it to be, and then you can specify, I want it done every month or every quarter or every year or every six, six months, and it'll automatically get rebalanced. So you always keep that, that amount of asset allocation that you feel best with. Experts say you only need to rebalance about once a year. And again, if you're in the pre-mixed funds, none of this you have to worry about. Time horizon, that's what this is all about, is about taking your distributions. Well, all of us are going to be long-term investors, which is the 10 years, and then eventually as we get closer to a point, we're going to start needing that money out of our account, and we're going to be a short-term investor. What you need to understand then as you get from those two points is what type of investments do I have? And if I'm getting close to retiring like two or three years away, Maybe I don't need it. I shouldn't have as much of my investments in the stocks because those can go down abruptly and I might need that money in the short term. On the other hand, if I'm 10 years away from retiring, maybe I want to take advantage of the growth in the market and have more exposure to growth in the interim. One strategy you can do, though, is as you get close to retiring, is take on the mindset of having three buckets of money. You can say, here's my long term investments that I definitely will not touch if at all possible, and I'll, be, I'll put that money in more, uh, more of the stock investments. Now here's the bucket of money that I definitely know I'm going to need in the next two to three years. So that money I want to probably put in that stable value fund. I know it's not making a whole lot, but I know it's not going down in value, and I need that money to pay for my insurance premium the next few years. And then the middle bucket might be the bucket that is making some dividends or earnings. And what you do is as you deplete the first bucket, you can replenish it with the middle bucket over time. So you can kind of use, you can actually set up three buckets to kind of coincide with this sort of a timeline. Even though you might be getting ready to retire, you want your short-term money, but you can still say, well, I still want to get some growth. So you might put some of it, a small percentage, whatever you're comfortable with, in a long-term bucket and let, it, let the market do its thing. So that's one possibility. But the fact is you need to be aware of where are you in your terms of your horizon. Are you going to be needing that money immediately? Are you going to retire, but maybe not need it for 10 years after that? Or are you going to retire and need it a month later? So kind of knowing where you are in that timeline is a very important process. How about what happens um, you know, as you get closer to retiring? Ten, we tend to get more conservative as, as we get older, at least some of us do. So some things you need to consider is that based on how much you've accumulated and then how, much, how long I think I'll live, and that's the big whammy, who knows? How long, how much can I take out per month or per year? And some statistics tell us that uh, I think this is a Social Security statistic, I'm not real sure. But once you hit 60, if you're female, you have about a 50% chance of living another 22 years. And males have the same odds of living about 18 more years. So we're talking easily into our 70s or 80s that you might need that money to last. So you, and that's the big what if, you know, how long do I think I'll need that money to last? So you need to consider if I have so much saved up and I think I'm going to live for 20 or 30 years, then you've got to kind of budget yourself and know that you can only take out so much over time. So you kind of, you know, those are the things we can't help you with. I can't predict when you're going to pass away, neither can you. But those are the things that you, you have to kind of have that conversation with yourself and think about, you know, do I want to go ahead and blow it the day I retire on that fifth wheel, the cabin and the helicopter that I needed to get? If you do, then if the what ifs happen two years later, you may not have any money to dip into. Or do you want to try and spread it out and use it for maybe expenses that may happen later on, especially long-term care, things like that. Uh, this is getting near the end. We're just going to remember, if you're in the deferred comp, you get a statement every quarter, whether you do paperless or not, and it'll show you a nice pie chart explaining what percent each of your investments show you. The problem is that they don't explain, it doesn't tell you what categories these are in, whereas this does. On this investment options at a glance, it actually tells you 
Is it a small? If you look under the different categories, it'll say large cap, small cap, international, global. So you'll have an idea of maybe what you're in, in terms of what parts of the world. So I encourage you, look at your statement and understand what it's telling you. If you have questions, you can call and we can help you with it. Uh, get logged into your pension account. If you haven't done that, you can go to retirement.wild.gov and get logged in or go to that RAIN site. Get logged into your pension account and do a couple of things. You can, first of all, make sure we have the correct beneficiaries and that we have your correct address. The big thing is your beneficiaries. The beneficiaries currently, while you're working, that's who will get your bucket should you pass away before you retire. When you retire, you're going to fill out a pension app and go through the process of putting a beneficiary down on that. So that's not, we're not doing the same thing. We're talking about beneficiary now while you're still working. So we really encourage you to log into your account because that's how you can see what your pension balance is. You can see how many months of service you have. You can run a pension estimate. So that pension site is really handy. Um, things that I hope you'll take away from this is maybe th start thinking about your budget. If you're getting close to retiring, look at what your essential expenses are versus your discretionary. And maybe do the worksheet and get an idea of, is the amount of, uh, the amount of expenses I have, am I going to be able to afford them? Am I going to have enough money coming in? And that means I would suggest you go to the Social Security site, get, look at your, pension, your statement from Social Security, and then also log into your pension account and get yourself an estimate on your pension account so you can start putting some numbers together and see is this going to be enough for me to pay what I want, what I know are going to be my bills when I retire. If you're not, don't have enough, maybe start trying to save a little more between now and retirement. Uh, I mentioned this already, please log into your accounts. There's your pension account and your deferred comp account. They are two separate systems. They do not know each other. So when you log into the pension, all you're seeing is pension data. If you want to go to the deferred comp, we've got a link there, but you have to create your own account. If you've never done that, there's a way to, in the deferred comp, you actually set up your own account on that login page of the deferred comp. It's under the username and passcode, and it says, first time visiting, let's get started. So just keep in mind, the pension deferred comp are two separate systems. They do not know each other. You will not see data on one from the other. You have to log into them separately. They have their own set of numbers, their own separate set of codes. The deferred comp does not know what your pension is, and they're, they're, they do not use the same numbers at all. So they have different logins totally. So you should log into both accounts if you have a deferred comp and check and see, do we have the correct address? Do we have the correct beneficiaries? And do the same thing in your pension to make sure that everything is current and up to date. And that is the Retirement Strategies Seminar. So um, I thank you for being here. I'm happy to take questions. Um, if, if you sat here for two hours of me gabbing, my hat's off to you. I hope you can wake up from your coma. Thanks for being here. If you have questions, go ahead and fire away. I can take them. Anybody? Can you buy five shares for a penny? If, if you participated years ago, you cashed it in and then came back to business, you can buy those? Yeah, yeah, you can buy years. There's a service purchase calculator on the Wyoming Retirement homepage that you can go into and you could see. Well, first of all, there's two things that you're talking about. There's a service purchase and there's a refund. So refund is where I, when I took money out of the pension, so if I was in the pension plan and I took money, I just wanted to take my money and run, and then I end up getting hired back into the pension, that's a redeposit. That's where I redeposit the money I took out along with the interest that it would have earned had it stayed in the plan and also the taxes that were withheld at the time I took that, that deposit. That's doing a redeposit, and what will happen is you'll then regain that time that you lost because when you pull that money out, you now, you're now like a new employee if you come back. A service purchase is where you actually just go in and buy extra years into the pension. If you're going to do a redeposit, which is what I think you're talking about, you'd actually have to call the office and find out. They can give you more of an estimate of how much it was that you took out and how much you would owe to get that back, and you would regain that time, yes. Did that... It would add time, so it would be counting toward your Rule of 85, yeah. But you may want to check and do a service purchase. You might want to run both calculations because one might be less than the other. It's hard to say because on the redeposit, you have to pay interest for the time the money was gone. So it might be cheaper to buy years, but you can do both. The service purchase calculator is on the Wyoming Retirement homepage, so you could run that estimate. 
And then you might want to go and find out like how much time you would be redepositing because let's say you took a re you only had three years. You can only buy, you can only redeposit and get three years, but you can buy up to five. So it may be more beneficial to buy five versus redeposit for three, but it depends. Sure. Anything else? Okay, thanks for being here. I hope everybody got the sign-in sheet that was at the back. If you didn't, would you please sign in?